we begin this morning, there's one other announcement that uh, did not make the, the bulletin that uh, came up. Is that Susie Bridges, who has been visiting with us for the past few weeks, uh, obeyed the gospel last Monday night, put her Lord on in baptism. We're so thankful for that, for her decision, of course, to follow the Lord. And after services, Susie, if you would uh, go to the back and let people meet you uh, and, and get to know you as well. So we rejoice. And uh, she's been coming as a visitor with uh, Jimmy Horn. And I'll let you all ask about that situation. This is, of course, our week that we've set aside in the year the elders have for our special contribution. Uh, the contribution today has the opportunity to go above and beyond what we normally do with that contribution. And so everything up to our budget, we'll, we'll, we'll keep for our budget amount, but everything over that amount today will be used for other things, special product, projects that the church here at West Hill accomplishes. And so we hope that you have planned accordingly and for this particular day, but as has become our tradition here, we are going to kind of look back at a West Hill, a year in review, and look forward to what is ahead of us and look at the plans which not only God has made for us, but uh, specifically here at West Hill that the elders have made for us. We think about 2016. It's been a, a quite an eventful year, uh, an epic year we might say. I don't know if it's just me getting older and paying more attention, but it just seems like there's been a, a lot of things that have happened in this year. We look at events that have gone on. We, we have gone through an historic presidential election. Uh, there is, in fact, we are still dealing with the fallout of that presidential election. We have fought the Zika, Zika virus. We, we have endured Islamic terror uh, yet again. We've even witnessed the Brexit earlier this year. We lost men like Gene Wilder, Arnold Palmer, David Bowie, Glenn Fry, some of those you may not know, some of them you do know, but I think we all remember most fondly Harambe, the gorilla. The United States dominated in the Summer Olympics this year. Pokemon Go came, and Pokemon Go went, thankfully. The Cubs won the World Series. 108 years since they won the World Series, but the Cubs win this year. Closer to home, West Hill has... I think, had another busy year. As we look at all the things that we have accomplished this year, our theme was fishing for men. We've had a lot of Bible studies this year. We've had uh, uh, some who are continuing in Bible studies. We're thankful for that. But to kick off the year, of course, you'll recall that we had Brother Kirk Brothers come in uh, and, and teach a series on, on Evangelism 101. That, uh, that seminar started a series or a class series that we went through for several months about evangelism and the basics of evangelism to take us uh, uh, to, to greater heights in, in the, the church, to, to plan better and to do better as Christians in, in our evangelistic efforts. We had our ministry fair as we normally do, our marriage retreat. Our VBS this year was, a, a, I think, a, a great opportunity to, to change the hearts and minds and teach people about Peter and the life of Peter and some of the things, uh, you know, we saw Peter from the shores of Galilee in three different scenes of his life. We uh, uh, had uh, two senior seminars this year, the Ladies' Day, the Ladies' Retreat, the Lectureship, and for the first time in over six decades, we had all the saints in Corsicana meet in a unified service. It has been a busy year. And in the end, I think West Hill has benefited immensely. Our hearts have been strengthened. Our faith has grown. Our love for one another has pulled us together as a church family. We have lost some through time. As the passing of time and the passing of people always happens, we have gained some, those who have moved into our community and become members here. We've gained those who have put the Lord on in baptism and have changed their lives in those ways. So we have gained some family members. And uh, we, we have uh, all of this while the world has attacked religion and Christianity in particular, West Hill has continued to survive and that is because it continues this, this great tradition of reliance on Christ. 
When we think about it, Christ is the answer. Because we have utterly and completely depended upon Christ for our growth, for our, for our survival, for our impact on this community, that his word would not return to him void, but would continue to change hearts and minds. Christ is the reason. Growth cannot come without Christ, and without Christ, growth really isn't growth. And we have to understand that. And so uh, those are, that's kind of a, a review of 2016 for West Hill. But, but then there's the 2017 coming up. We, we look to the theme the elders have set before us or setting before us the theme for 2017. Faith, hope, and love. These three abide. The greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope and love and so next year as we we begin our sermon series and things we're going to do 60 days of faith and 60 days of hope and 60 days of love hopefully as Christians our faith and our hope and our love will grow because of the vision that the elders have put before us this morning I want to talk a little bit about planning though and whenever we have a plan or a challenge that is set before us, we, we, we think about what it means to, to have goals set before us and to reach and strive toward those goals, the steps that it takes. You know, uh, uh, with, with any endeavor, whenever there is a goal set, we, we, we subdivide it into smaller steps. They're the stepping stones or the steps to get up to the, the ultimate goal where we want to be. And we want to be those who long for God. Who, who have a relationship with him that draws closer and closer and closer, deeper in love with him. We were studying this morning in our class in, in, in Psalm 84 about how we long to be in the very presence of God, that our hearts might sing his praises forever. God, our sun and our shield, our light and our protection in this life, that ultimately we may get to be there. We say, that's my goal. My goal is heaven. My goal is to be in the presence of God, to dwell in his house forevermore. But we know that in order to get there, there are certain steps we have to take here. As it is with, with every endeavor. When we have that goal, there are certain steps that we have to take. And that is what we call our plan. There are some who come along and say, yes, but the Bible says we shouldn't plan. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, it, it says that, uh, uh, you know, it, it takes those who are making plans and tells them they shouldn't make plans. But that's not what James 4 is speaking of. If you have your Bibles, in fact, turn to James chapter 4. As we, we look this morning at four keys to planning to making a plan that is viable, to making a plan that is, is biblical, to making a plan that is going to uh, reach the goals that we desire most, which ultimately is going to be heaven. Four things that I see in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, that, that if we will follow these things, we can be successful as Christians and as the church uh, which Christ died to save. Let us begin by reading our passage in chapter 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, and we will stay there a year, remain a year, and we will trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will be. What is your life? It is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that as it is you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil so whoever knows to do good and do it not or fails to do it for him it is a sin so we see this picture that is painted for us James is is challenging them as another one of the the cautions about sins in communication we think about the book of James and how often uh, he's dealing with, with the, the communication errors we have. Uh, you say you're saved by faith apart from works. You say. You communicate to God this way. Be not many of you teachers, for you shall receive a stricter judgment communication error. The tongue is a, a minor part of who you are and yet is a major evil in society communication errors come now you who say 
It's again an error in communication. Communication we might have with others, communication that we have with God, but especially a communication that we would have in ourselves. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. In order to understand what a good plan is, we need to know what we don't know. I know that seems kind of, kind of strange, but we need to know what we do not know. Most people, when they are making a plan, feel like they are in control of all things. These people are making their calendar year, a year in advance. We will go into this town. We will do such and such things. They are deciding where they will go, when they will go, uh, how long they will stay, what they will do when they get there, make profit by trade. And they're looking at an entire year's calendar, and James says, but you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You've got to know what you don't know. We look at these, these details of their plans. When, where, why, how long. Those are sound principles of planning. Anytime we, we, start, we sit down and we start making a calendar out or we start setting goals, uh, we're, we're going to say, well, well, when are these things going to happen? Uh, how are these things going to come to pass? Why will these things be accomplished? What exactly are we wanting to do? Those are sound principles. Those who, who might be coaches in life, uh, uh, you know what it means to look at a team and say, okay, uh, here's what we're going to do first. Here's why we're going to do these things because our goal is, is set over here. Or maybe you're an employer or a business owner and, the, and you have a business plan here. This is my goal, but in order to get there, I need to know what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it, why I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do this. Those are sound principles. And even with the church, we know that what, what we want to do is we want Christians to grow stronger in the faith. We want those who are lost to come into the church and be, be, become Christian. We want those who are in poverty to be uplifted and, and, and aided uh, by, the, by the assistance of the church. That's the goal. That's what we want to see. But we need to know how we're going to do that, how long we're going to be able to do this, when this will be accomplished, where and how. We must admit, though, that planning those things, we only have a shadow of the answer to all those questions. I, I know what, what the goal is. I know what the steps to take are. But I do not know what tomorrow is. And that was the problem with them planning in James chapter 4. It wasn't that they were making a plan. It was they were making a plan without understanding what they do not know taking into account the variables that we cannot control. In order to make a good plan, you've got to understand we don't know everything. There are certain things we don't know. Number two, making a good plan means that we know our frailty. We need to know our personal frailty, that life itself is not guaranteed. What he says in the first part is, you're making these plans, but you don't know what tomorrow is. In the second part of verse 14, he says, for what is life, or what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and vanishes. He compares our life to mist, or a vapor, or smoke, a, a thin fog that rolls across the land. And so uh, we, we think about the fog. We, we, it, it's here, it's visible, and yet uh, its substance is transient. We reach out to lay hold on the fog. You know, uh, uh, Solomon refers to that as, as grasping at the wind. And when you open your hand, it's not there. He says that's what your life is. It is there, but it's, it's, it's not there. It's transient. It's, and then whenever, when, when it vanishes... It's unseen. It's gone. It's always in motion. And then it's gone. It's short. We cannot add time to our lives. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 27, Jesus says, uh, Which of you being anxious can add one cubit to your length? But... 
another translation, and, and a lot of the modern translations have it this way, which of you being anxious can add one day to your life? One hour to your life? You see, we, we, we can't, you know, grit our teeth and shut our eyes and say, oh, I'm going to grow one more inch. I know some of you, as little kids, uh, <laughs> I'm going to grow big and tall. And you just never did. Well, you, you can't just wish that I'm going to have an extra hour right before death, that God will add one hour to my day, that God, or to my life, or one day to my life, or one year to my life. We cannot, by being anxious, lengthen our days. James says your life is, is like a vapor, it's like a mist that appears for a little while. It's seen, it's visible, but it's in motion, and it vanishes away. That's the frailty of life. And we have to understand that when we start making our plans. The prime example of this, and possibly even what James has in mind, comes from Luke chapter 12. When the rich fool recognizes that his, his harvest is going to be bountiful this year, and he says, I'm going to tear down my barns, and I'm going to build bigger barns. And as he's making his plans the Lord comes and says, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Tonight the frailty of your life will come to its conclusion. Then whose will all these things be? In life, let us plan knowing our own frailties. Number three, third key to planning is know your dependence on God. What you ought to say, verse 15, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Now, James is not giving us some sort of talisman or some verbal formula that if we will uh, say, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills, Lord willing, Lord willing, um, that, that does not guarantee that our plans will come true. Saying Lord willing is not what, what, what's in, in store here. The idea is that you make sure that all of your plans include God. Your plans for work include God. The plans for your family, make sure God is included. Plans for your recreation, keep God in those plans. Always keep God there because we are dependent upon God. What does that mean? It means that God holds life, our lives, in his hand. Job would say in Job 12.10, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. I'm a living thing, therefore my life is in God's hand. It lasts as long as the pleasure of God desires it to last. In God's hand is the breath of mankind, that which keeps us going. Seizing upon that, in Acts chapter 17, Paul gives much the same thing. He says he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of this earth having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet, He is actually not far from each of us. For in Him we live and move and have our very being. Acts 17, 26 through 28. God holds our lives. We are dependent upon him. Yes, we, we often think that we are in control and we will choose all these things, but really God is the one that is in control. He holds our life. But not only does God hold our lives, he holds our prosperity in his hand. Job again said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Job looking back over his life and seeing where he had been in great riches and prosperity and where he was moved to in great poverty and sickness. And ultimately he came, comes back and he says, I, I was naked 
as I came, I'm naked when I will leave. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. But then in, he makes this great statement, blessed be the name of the Lord. Even in all of that, he praises God and worships God even in the transience of his own prosperity. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job understood that God is in control of even our prosperity. The earth is the Lord's. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. Psalm 24 and verse 1. And not only are we dependent on him for life and prosperity, we are dependent upon him to just enjoy what we have. We saw this past Wednesday night in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 19, everyone to whom God has given wealth, there's God, he's, he is the, the originator of our prosperity and possessions, and power to enjoy them. God has given the power to enjoy the things that we have. To accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This, this is the gift of God. As we are making our plans, if the Lord wills, it is a recognition that God, God is the one who is in control here. Not me. And then number four, you need to know what you don't know. You need to know your frailty. You need to know your dependence upon God. And you need to know what is right. Verse 16, as it is, you boast in arrogance. Such boasting is evil. So, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Planning with God isn't just good. It's a good idea. It is right. It is a moral a necessity. It is right because to fail to do so, he says, is sin. When God is ignored, we boast in our arrogance. James, James says, frankly, that is evil. But, but how are we boasting in, in our arrogance when Christians emphasize God on a Sunday but relegate Him to the back seat on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Saturday? He says that's evil because God deserves preeminence in our lives. To boast in our arrogance is to say that I am in control. I choose what I'm going to do. It all comes down to my decision. And yet I still don't know what tomorrow is. I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know if what I'm going to do is make a profit. I don't know those things. But when we act as if we do, we are boasting in arrogance. And he says, such boasting is evil. That, that's the, the main characteristic of the devil himself. So much so that some translations say, such boasting is of the devil or of the evil one. But it connects us with him. But if I'm going to make a plan that pleases God, I need to know what is the right way to live. So that I can plan those right ways. That I can dwell in Him. So what does that mean? It means as we're planning for the future. We keep God central in all our plans. We realize our dependence on God. In everything that we do, we walk in His way. And we are prepared for life to vanish. Because that is our lot. So what are your plans for the future? Not, not, not for 2017, but your real future, eternity. The future that begins the moment after you die. Consider this, and all the things in this world that we think we control but we really don't control, there's really only one thing that you're in control of, one thing. That's how frail and weak and impotent we are. There's one thing we control. 
where we will spend eternity. That's it. You know, you can know that you are spending eternity in heaven. You may not know when you're going to die. You may not know what's going to happen on the highway. The car accidents may come. We don't know those things, but we know where we can spend eternity. And you can be certain about that. You can plan for that. Right now, making plans for that eternity. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to give each one of us an opportunity of eternal life. And every single day since then, thousands of people have died spurning his offer of grace. God, I don't need it. God, I don't want it. Or just not thinking about it. They will spend thousands of dollars to build their homes, thousands of dollars on education, thousands of dollars to build a career, a career thousands of dollars for their own comfort, but they will not give one thought for the future that matters. The future that begins that moment after death. The Bible says that people like this are nearsighted and cannot see afar off. They do not glimpse eternity. That is willful blindness. So how are you planning? What are you planning for? There's a lot of people who are planning by, you know, stuffing some money in under the mattress. That's, that's their plan. Getting a good education. That's my plan. Hoping that God is not serious about condemning the lost or, or the lukewarm or, or those that are wayward? Is, is that how you're planning? That he's not serious? That he won't really bring hell to us if we deny him? Is your planning by trusting in a denominational plan of salvation or the sinner's prayer or faith only salvation? What will those things bring you on the day of judgment? What will a good education bring you on the day of judgment? What will trusting in a a man-made plan bring you on the day of judgment? Condemnation. That's what it will bring. But obeying God in faith, repenting of self-centeredness and arrogance, of planning without God, confessing that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the King that God has appointed and being baptized for the remission of your sins, you plan wisely. And if everything else that you attempt on the earth fails from the earth's perspective, and yet you have planned wisely, God's promise of heaven will be a success for you. You follow his plan. Don't plan. Take no thought about it. Don't plan. You have everything to lose and nothing to gain. But planning wisely, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Please do not add to your sin this morning by not doing good, by failing to do what you know is right. If this morning you're ready to respond to God's offer of grace, His invitation of salvation, won't you respond as we stand and as we sing. Beyond the